Hello, my name is Yanni Wayhawk. I am Sichangu Lakota, um, member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe in South Central South Dakota, and I'm a visual artist. Uh, my studio is based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, my practice, my studio practice, is founded in the practices of easel painting, focusing on abstraction, and uh, Lakota art forms, specifically beadwork and porcupine quillwork. Um, and the abstract is, abstraction um, that is within those histories. And my work combines those influences uh, conceptually and uh, through material. To me, feminism simply means an acknowledgement of the equal value and worth of all people across gender representation and an active practice of that equal value. As far as indigenous feminism goes or, or feminism from a native perspective, I think that that means um, not, a, not working towards a goal that we haven't yet quite achieved, but working towards shaking off the influences of colonialism that have altered our worldviews and perspectives and the way that we live our lives. Um, in regards to how we see and value our community members. So you can't speak generally about native feminism or indigenous feminism because every tribe has its own uh, worldviews and tribal structures and, and it's, not, it's not an across the board um, perspective, but from my own perspective, from a Lakota perspective, um, there's a balance between genders and there's also a recognition that genders are not binary. And there's a value in every single person's existence and worth. <clears throat> so uh, from a Lakota perspective, uh, there's an acknowledgement of the worth and value of all, all our relatives and the interconnectivity of health and well-being between all life. Uh, there's a balance between value and roles and um, contributions across the sexes and genders. And there's also a recognition of the fact that uh, gender is not a, a binary concept. It's not an either or. Um, there are valued places for our two-spirit relatives in our cultural teachings. Um, but the, the foundation the, of our worldview is one that recognizes uh, equal value and worth of all life. Um, and so an indigenous feminist perspective is simply getting back to those worldviews and, and a way of living our life that recognizes and um, holds those teachings true as we move throughout the world. A heathen's penance, the imposed load is um, uh, a work that I was asked to produce in response to uh, an exhibition at the Institute of American Indian Arts Museum of Contemporary Native Arts uh, Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it was uh, on Kateri, um, and I can't pronounce her name, I know as well as I should be able to, but uh, Kateri de Gowitska. Uh, who was a Mohawk and Algonquin woman uh, who was the first Native woman to be canonized as a saint in uh, the Catholic Church. And she was um, alive in the 1600s, and she died at the age of 24. She converted to Catholicism, I believe, when she was 19. So it was only five years that she was actively practicing Catholicism. Um, but she was raised... Uh, she had an Algonquin mom and a Mohawk dad and was raised predominantly in a uh, Mohawk community. <clears throat> um, but her parents died really early of um, smallpox, as did her brother. And she battled smallpox as well and was scarred um, pretty severely from the smallpox. And so her, she was adopted by relatives and was raised by, I think, her aunt and uncle. Um, <clears throat> and so she had a... a a hard life, a lot, a tremendous amount of Mohawk people from her community died during that bout of smallpox. Um, 
they tried to marry her later and she refused marriage and um later uh made a vow of chastity chastity or chastity chastity i think um i'm not catholic i don't know all these things <laughs> uh but she made a vow you know um of virginity for life and then was um you know practicing her catholicism and but she one of the things that uh i think is a really important part of her story is that she had extremely excessive penance practices um and so that painting is representative of those penance practices uh the pathway that goes up the center of the painting is made of all these tally marks one two three four five one two three four five so they say that you know she would she would sleep on thorns she would take her moccasins off and walk extended distances barefoot through the snow she would put ashes in her food to dull the taste of her food she would um, do lashings to herself, and it's written that her lashings would be like upwards of 1,200 at a time. So that's where those hash marks come from. Um, and there's more. It, it goes beyond that. Um, those are just a few. Um, but it's thought that her excessive penance practices, along with uh, what her body went through with smallpox, uh, led to her untimely death. And as I was studying her, so I'm, I'm not from that region, um, and I'm not Catholic, so when I was asked to partake in that show, I had to study Kateri, you know, and, and research and, and find out about her story, and um, it was really up, outstanding to me that this young woman, um, you know, has, has been canonized as a saint, and some of the reasons that have been used to uh, lift her up as, you know, a particularly um, good Christian or, you know, good practicing Catholic. Um, some of those qualities are qualities that she would have learned and would have um, practiced as a Mohawk woman. And then some of them, you know, I mean, as far as that, like her, her this idea of her being a devout Catholic, um, those penance practices to me uh, feel highly, highly problematic. So I can't help but wonder if you've been raised a particular way, you know, within a within a native community, and then Catholicism is introduced because she was a, this is in the 1600s, so this was at you know it was the earliest introduction to their community, um, and you're then taught that everything that makes up your worldviews and your spirituality and what you've been taught is is wrong um that you are a heathen that your community members your family members the people that love and raise you are heathens that you know you've got to change your ways if you're going to possibly be sal sal or saved um and all you know just the, the amount of mental load that that would have um bore down on such a young mind I can't help but think, like, are those excessive penance practices because, like, how much did she have to self-punish to feel that she was absolved of what she was taught was bad, you know? And how much of that excessive penance practices would she have had to have done if she was praying for her community, if she was praying for her relatives and her family? So that's where the imposed load comes from in the title, because that's something that was imposed on her in her life, this, this way of thinking that what you know what she had been taught was um was wrong was bad was sinful was against the uh, against god against creation against all of these things um but then in her when they were uh, one of the things that they they credit her for is her industriousness as a catholic virtue but they were they speak about it in regards to her quill work and bee work practices. Um, and industriousness is a indigenous value. And that practice of quill work and bead work is something that she learned in her own community. And so that's that's a, a value and a virtue that was was within her already. And so it's it's a it's a shared value. Um, but the so the side panels on that painting represent 
they're painted to represent that um, porcupine quill work, which is an indigenous art form, and the uh, value and, and virtue that she learned um, through her own community. Uh, and then, then the the cross at the top, which actually is a broken piece that looks like a four directions cross and a, like a minus sign kind of floating behind it. That's strategic as well because none of us, because we can't speak to her today, we can't truly understand how much of Catholicism she was understanding as true to the way Catholics think about it or how much of it she was understanding through a Mohawk perspective of spirituality, through her own understanding of spirituality, of creation, of, of, of creator, of um, her, your, her connection to her spirituality. We don't and can't understand when she looked at a Christian cross how much content of her understanding of that religion came from her own upbringing and her own um, surroundings in her Mohawk community. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's that cross is ambiguous. That cross is meant to kind of be this either or place to speak to the fact that, um, you know, she's been canonized as this Catholic saint, which, okay, but she's also this Mohawk woman who was raised in the Mohawk community. And I think it's important that that is, is, um, really strongly considered when we consider her history. So the, the take Care of Them Suite was made um, at High Point Center for Printmaking in Minneapolis. Uh, they are screen prints uh, with metallic foil. And <clears throat> it's a suite of four. And they, um, the, they wouldn't exist had I not had the opportunity to work with High Point. Um, that particular body of work, the way that they came to be, I think only would have come out had I been working on paper. Um, and so I'm really grateful to High Point and what they, um, what they offered in that partnership and in that collaboration. Um, and so the works, there are four pieces, um, and they represent, they're, they're abstracted, but they're, they're not that abstracted. They're fairly representational, but they're <clears throat> abstracted representations of, um, women's, uh, dentillium dresses, the plain style women's dentillium dresses on wool. Um, and this is a, a style of dress that has, has been around for as long as we've been trading for wool um, and that women still wear today. So there's four of them. There's a navy blue, a gold, a green, and a red. And they all have um, English and Lakota titles. Um, Wolahokuntia slash lead is the blue one. And um Wokahe create is gold. Uh Naki Chizi is protect, that's the green one. And um Wachan Taganaka is nurture. I'm still practicing my Lakota in regards to these titles because um I'm not a affluent Lakota speaker. I uh I know I have a base understanding of, of words. And part of the reason why I use Lakota in my titles is because it helps me continue to learn and to practice. Um, but part of the other reason that I used Lakota in these particular titles is that it's, um, they speak to specific concepts. So the Lakota and English titles are not one-to-one -one translations. The, they don't, um, Wokahe uh, is not create per se, or each one is not a one, tra one translation, but what they are is related concepts. So the uh, Lakota language is used to speak to particular uh, values and practices and understandings of their related English words. So when I'm thinking of the word lead, this is the concept that I'm thinking of. Um, the Lakota concept or understanding of, of leadership. Um, but these four pieces, lead, create, protect, and nurture, speak to the ways that our women relatives collectively care for our communities through the various um, uh, actions, 
through the various um, styles of, of, of care through, um, through varied personalities and family roles, through kinship relationships, the way that collectively we care for one another. So the series is meant to recognize and honor uh, extended family and kinship roles in our communities that really value um, and honor those relationships and recognize how important they are to rearing healthy individuals. That it's not just you and your um, nuclear family or your immediate family, but it's this you know idea of extended family and community that collectively cares for for one another. And um, I thought about it because I got it was kind of a, a roundabout way to getting to the work, but. Um, so my mom is a veteran. She's a Navy veteran, and she also um, she used to dance, uh, and she had a red dress that she wore with Centillium. And um, and I was thinking about the way that I was thinking about the way that our veterans are honored within our within Native communities and outside of Native communities as well, and that they're honored for <clears throat> the way that they protect our communities. And I value and honor that as well, especially being the daughter of a veteran. Um, but I was also thinking about how many people um, play those roles that aren't in those formal positions. And I was thinking about how our women every day protect our families, uh, lead through example, nurture, care, create, you know, that literally create our families through the creation of, of you know, through, uh, through bringing human beings into the world, but also create um, homes and create goods that clothe us and, you know, moccasins for our feet and all of the, you know, the various ways that, that women collectively care for us. Um, and so I wanted to create this body of work that honors um, individuals and their unique contributions within a communal structure that um, is, is structured in a way that recognizes both individuality and community and the worth and value of all of those things together. Um, and so they have different, they each have different um, styles of adornment that are meant to represent different personalities. And in my mind, they represent different ages too. So the the lead print is the one in navy blue is like the most um, old school or old style, and it for me that's the one why it's lead that's that's Unchi that's grandma and um and then the create the gold one she's the most blingy um she's the most contemporary in style and and ha you know it's the the print reads as as yellow like on paper but it's gold the the ink is gold. Um, and so that one is like, you know, the, the um, your younger relative, you know, the uh, uh, younger sister or a cousin who, you know, may watch out for you or, or somebody who's, you know, she's, she's creative, not only in the, in her production, but she's also, you know, maybe at the age where she's starting her own family, you know, so she's starting to bring creation into the world as well through, through her children. Um, and then protect, I see protect as like the older auntie, um, in the, in the crew. And, um, and then nurture, I see as the mom. Um, and because it's the most closest reference to my, to my own mom. And so there, you know, I don't mean to say that that's what everybody else should see, but that's who I see them as. But they're meant to have these unique personalities, unique traits meant to recognize their individuality, but also through this lineage of dress that is, you know, still made and danced in today, it also recognizes that continuity throughout our, uh, throughout our family and cultural relationships that go back generations. So one thing that I, I think is important to express is that there are two ways that I approach my work. Um, there's work that I make for museum and gallery spaces, and then there's work that I make strictly for cultural practices and familial use. 
So I create um, you know, paintings and mixed media works and sculpture and now video and photo installations. Um, and I also make dresses that myself and my daughters dance in and moccasins for my family and, and things that are used strictly within uh, cultural um, use and, and within our family. And to me, neither is more important than the other. They're, um, they are related and they inform one another. Um, but the greater public doesn't see that other side of my practice because it's not on my website. It doesn't, you know, have the, the public platform that, um, that, you know, galleries and museums and the work that goes into those spaces has. All of, all of the forms of my making, whether they're for cultural practice or whether they happen in museum and gallery spaces, they're all reflective of myself and my life experiences. And, and the way that I walk through the world and, and by various forms of education and upbringing. And so they're all completely related and they can't be pulled apart. And it's not an either or, and it's not something that's separate. It's not compartmentalized for me. And other than the fact that I might compartmentalize, this work goes over here and this work goes over here. <laughs> But they, they are completely related and completely inform one another because um, those are all things that I participate in and they're all things that I value and they're all things that I love. Yes, my work is rooted in who I am as a Lakota woman. Yes, my work draws from Lakota artistic tradition, but I think that it is important to understand and recognize that those art forms and those uh, modes of making and the thought and teaching and conception, uh, conceptual um, underpinnings of that work and that lineage is valuable inside contemporary art spaces. And I think important and necessary inside contemporary art spaces because our contemporary art spaces are supposed to be reflective of the public, of the world. And Native people are a part of that and we're often not recognized, not included, and not valued at the same level of our peers. And so they may seem to folks to be these separate issues, but it's only because they've been presented as such so far in the way that we tell our artistic histories and the way that we exhibit um, art made by various people. There's this gallery and there's that gallery. And Native folks are in the Native Arts Gallery and it's almost always historic. But we are a living, valuable people today. And so our works have a place inside contemporary art spaces. And just because I'm pulling from my, my artistic lineage as a Lakota woman does not make my work historic. It makes my work contemporary today because I'm making it today. And it should be included in those spaces and thought about um, with and alongside all sorts of other folks that also represent the greater public. There are a number of things that I want people to take away uh, after an exchange or during an exchange with my work. One is that I, I really hope and I strive for my work to fill people. I strive for my work to offer something um, through beauty, through creation, that um, is a form of giving to the audience that I hope that they feel and see and experience, uh, not, only cognitive, not only cognitively, but physically as well. And with that exchange, I hope that the, the moment of reciprocity comes in the fact that folks are willing to engage in the conversations that are being presented in the work, which are challenging. And um, they often bring forth very difficult parts of our national history. And so I hope to give something and I hope that people will in return pause and think about and take on the challenge of critical thinking in the way that our national history is told and taught that more often than not omits the indigenous history of this land base and its people. The real honest truth of this country is not taught in our academic systems. It's often looked over or brushed over 
Um, and that has affected the art world. You know, our, our art world is reflective of our greater society. And so Native history and Native people, contemporary peoples today, are often brushed over and pushed aside as well. And I want people to remember, and I want them to think carefully about how um, how Native people and Indigenous history is all too often omitted from our national narrative. And so when they see that we're missing from those conversations, I want them to speak up. I want them to recognize it. I want them to have a moment of being like, oh, this 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 panel is about diversity. There's no Native people on the panel. This exhibition is claiming it's diverse. There's no Native people in the exhibition. This talk about feminism on this land base isn't including Indigenous voices. Why not? And to also recognize the beauty that we have to contribute and to offer to our collective communities so that hopefully as a people, um, when we can recognize the gifts that we all have and we start to honor and lean on those gifts and uh, respect each other's place within, uh, within life, hopefully we can work towards healthier communities. And that's really what my aim is for in the work. It's to call out these harder conversations and to ask people to think critically about our values and the way that we um, move through the world and respect and honor one another. But it's with a long-term goal and aim towards hopefully providing a small contribution to asking people to think about how we can be better relative to one another so that we can build healthier futures. And thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I don't know what your sign off wants. I don't know what the format of you want for the sign off. Any sort of sign off is fine. I think just a thank you for listening is, is good with me. Um, thank you again, Diani. I'm going to end our recording here.